Thank you. Good morning, Go Yang. And it's great to be back in Korea. I was here 11 years ago to give a talk uh, at TEDx in uh, Seoul. Uh, I didn't have long to speak in a TEDx format, so it's great to have more time. Because my aim today is to bring to life guerrilla gardening, to explain what guerrilla gardening is about and why people do it and the form it takes and also to reflect on why it has taken off particularly over the last 20 years and continues to inspire people to, to get gardening in places where they otherwise wouldn't. So, I'm Richard Reynolds and you can see me here at night gardening because I garden on land that isn't mine and I don't ask permission first. And that's what guerrilla gardening is. It's typically public land. It's typically obviously neglected, but not always. Sometimes it's not clear who owns the land and it might be private. So a quick, simple explanation to start with. Um, this is Silvano and Chris, some neighbors of mine. And you can see some scrappy public land. It's a junction just over the road from where the three of us were living. And we went out one evening to sow some Californian poppy seeds and some sweet alisum. And a few weeks later, it looked like this. A little bit greener, a little bit more fragrant, a little bit more beautiful. And for us as well, it was a little bit of a protest because we were pretty upset about some of the engineering and roadworks that were going on. And we'd lost a few guerrilla gardens by then to the road widening. So it was also a way of saying, this needn't be like this. We can at least bring some joy during the construction phase. And here's another one, same junction a few years earlier. On the left, before we struck, and on the right, what it looks like after some guerrilla gardening. And in this occasion, like most of what I do, it wasn't just a one night hit and run and leave it to nature. It's actually six years of commitment to that space before sadly, we also lost it because the mayor of London widened the road. You win some, you lose some. This is my simple explanation for why people do it. So we've got three circles in a Venn diagram, and hopefully my Google translations into Korean make sense. But uh, if they don't, I'll explain my intention. The blue circle is for people who do guerrilla gardening to say something. They have a message. That could be a protest message like our little gesture about the roadworks, so or it could be a really serious message. It could be political, it could be environmental, it could be an artistic statement, but that is their primary motivation. The orange circle is the social side. Gardening is a great conversation starter. And if you're gardening in public, in a place that it doesn't look like you should be, because perhaps you're not wearing a high-vis jacket and it's the evening time, then those who are curious do tend to stop and ask what's going on. And it's a wonderful thing. Also, it's a great way of getting together. If you need help, if you want to make a quick transformation, gardening with friends, with people that you've recruited who are like-minded is a great activity to do. But the green circle is the heart of it if you're going to create something truly transformative that stands the test of time. And that is you do it because you love gardening. And there are many a garden lover who just doesn't have enough room in their own private garden who cannot resist but to spill over beyond their boundaries. Maybe they've got a few spare plants and they just need to put them somewhere. But they've got the eye, they've got the knowledge to be able to transform a space where they can see potential. And of course, these motivations overlap. You get the pure protest gardeners for whom the garden might last only a few hours. You get those who love gardening, but do it solo. They do it on their own. They do it without making a statement. And many of them are very quiet about it. So over the course of the presentation today, my aim is to share all of this and explain why it's taken off in such a way and what can those who are in the industry perhaps take as inspiration from that. 
a bit about me. Um, this is me at the back there, aged about two, with my twin brother. Um, gardening, of course, because that's what I did as a young child and have always done. That's why I'm a guerrilla gardener. I am passionate about gardening. It's something I always turn to to relax, whether it was at break time at school because I wasn't really into football, or when I was uh, at university greening my windowsill. So gardening was an obsession, but strangely, I've never had a garden of my own. And sadly, I still don't. And it's not a deliberate choice, it's a repeated accidental mistake. So at the age of about 26, I found myself living here, not in the green Devonian countryside of rural England, but by now in central London in Elephant and Castle, which was redeveloped a lot in the 1960s. Um, that's where I live. So no garden, not even a windowsill. And I understand, certainly looking around Go Yang, that there's a lot of people like me who also live high in the sky with a great view, but no space of your own. And the view for me was one of London's busiest junctions, the largest bus interchange in Europe. And there's a bit of greenery in the middle, or there was back then when I moved in, but um, a missed opportunity. Typical scrubby grass and a few evergreen hedges, but nothing that when you're at street level, at that micro scale, nothing that really lifts the heart um, and no formal opportunity for those of us living there to get involved. This is the depressing sight that greeted me every day. This is by the main entrance to our tower block. Um, so the gardener in me saw the opportunity. That was the starting point. The house proud newcomer also was a bit embarrassed, to be honest. It's like, look where I've moved to, what a dump. So I wanted to do something about that. But the community was in disrepair itself. It had disintegrated. The tenants group had been closed down by the council because of financial irregularities. There was a great deal of distrust in the building. And I had been there by this point for about five months and seen that nothing was going to happen unless we just got on and do, did it. The council certainly weren't going to encourage anything. They wanted a cooling off period. So I went in at night to avoid confrontation, to avoid awkward embarrassments. And because I was scared that I would get in trouble, I've since learned that that fear is actually a bit unnecessary. And I transformed it. And it's not a great photo. It's, it's not framed quite like the other one. But this is the same patch many years on after I'd adopted it successfully that night with a bit of lavender and some cordyline and some cyclamen and gradually added here, you can see a Margaret Merrill, lovely floribunda rose, some scented leaf geranium, some hookera, a bit of crocosmia. That was a mistake because that's far too invasive. Um, and and the, the lovely rich acanthus leaf at the back. And that was a tiny patch of what was a big opportunity these beds were also adjacent to our tower block, at the time partly empty, partly overgrown with very dull shrubs. I gradually removed what, um, well, what was old and shabby or clipped it back and introduced a lot more. Um, the wildlife came as well, which is always uh, an important bonus. Um, it wasn't perfect though, because of course I didn't have permission. And people in the building realized I didn't have permission and complained that they were paying, as was my landlord, paying for service charges. So the council at once came in after three years and chopped a lot down. This is a buddleia when it should have been blooming. But that actually was the turning point. That was the moment when I could then say, look, I've been doing it for three years. Now's the time to get permission. And they couldn't say no. They said if I... If I'd asked at the beginning, they would have said no, but now they could see the evidence was commitment and success, and it has since thrived. And although I do no longer live there, Silvana and Chris and others continue to look after it. And I was there earlier in the week, and it's, it's a wonderful thing to see the way many of these plants have matured. I didn't invent guerrilla gardening. 
actually you can find evidence of guerrilla gardening in the Bible. There's a story of some fairly malicious gardening as someone sows weeds in another man's um, field. But the term guerrilla gardening was coined exactly 50 years ago. Um, and Liz Christie here in New York uh, was one of the founders of a group called the Green Gorillas. And what they found were these abandoned private bits of land. The owners had left Manhattan. It was an area that was depopulating. And it was a young group of students and artists who saw the opportunity in the dereliction, who began to take it over and create informal community gardens. And over 50 years, some of those gardens have flourished into landmarks, uh, but it's been a very slow journey for them. Uh, initially, informal agreement was, was, was reached after a few years, but it wasn't until only 20 years ago that more formal permission were granted. Um, here they are in the early days. I got to visit and meet some of them um, in 2006. Liz sadly passed away um, in the 1980s. Um, but this is the early days. And this is my wife and children visiting the Liz Christie Garden, where it all began, um, this time last year. And it is spectacular. You can see the maturity of the landscape now in an area of lower east side which was very rough but is now rapidly transforming and yet despite the regeneration the garden carries on what is sad is that it is very gated it isn't open it is a it is a community garden but it, you have to be connected to that community to be able to know when access is possible that is i understand it necessary and essential but my passion is not for community gardens like this. That hasn't been so much my opportunity. I instead like gardening in the community, gardens without boundaries and borders, which are more vulnerable and are less good for gathering, but um, easier to share. Um, this is the Rosa Rose Garden in Berlin that I visited about 15 years ago. Like in New York, same context, dereliction, decline, artists move in, they create a community space. Um, the, the transition to permanence in Berlin has been much more difficult um, and sadly the Rosa Rose Garden uh, is no more. I'm going to tell you one more story about what I've been doing, and then I'm going to get into a bit more of the reasons why I think it has become so interesting um, and, and popular. So this is the location I'm going to talk about. You can see from the map, this is very central London. Uh, Westminster Bridge, the Houses of Parliament, Waterloo Station. And it's remarkable in a global city like London that such prime pieces of public landscape are so neglected. But I'm afraid to say that is the state of our country in this century. Scrubland, grasses, a few cordyline. It offers very little for the human eye. It offers very little to nature. So what we decided to do was to transform it into something much more uplifting and much more nature friendly. And by this point, I'd been gathering supporters and interest. And in an era before social media was mainstream, this is 2006, Facebook's barely 18 months old. I recruited people through my website and over four nights, we dug up all that grass, we shook out the soil, I took the grass to the local recycling dump that's also now gone, and we planted hundreds of small lavender plants. But I also encouraged people to come along and bring anything they liked to express their personal taste. So we had Photinia, we had Ceanothus, we had a holly, we had a few little annuals that just lasted that season. And if you see on YouTube, uh, I have a channel, youtube.com slash the Gorilla Gardener, where there's a lot of videos and there's a video link there um, 
I'm going to play some video later on, but, but not this one. And here we are. Um, a few years later, you can see a similar shot with the lavender now very mature. The cordial line are still there. We left them, although they've slowly reduced. And some of the shrubs in the middle are beginning to rise up. Um, here it is and in a different season. So we did the lavender planting in spring. Later that autumn, there was huge amounts of weeding to do to stop the lavender being crowded out. But we used that opportunity to plant a lot of tulips, which um, I just love the intensity of that um, and, and the, the combination. So we went mostly red, a few black and, and yellow. And you can see the photinia and euphorbia maturing. Even a few edibles. It's pretty dirty, that, I should emphasize, but we couldn't resist to at least give it a go. And someone gets to eat it, even if it's the wildlife. Uh, raspberries too, sunflowers, irises donated from a friend who was working at the Royal Horticultural Society's garden at Wisley. Um, I love that. And some flax that we just sowed. So these are pretty tough, resilient plants. This was not a place we could ever go in water. So it needed to be sustainable with the poor quality soil that was there, very free draining, um, and a lot of sunlight and heat. This is um, Lila, um, who I met gorilla gardening when we were planting those tulips. Um, and five years later, um, I proposed to her when we were weeding in this gorilla garden. And, and she's my wife, who you saw earlier in the presentation. So when I said the social benefits of gorilla gardening are great, I can confirm it. Um, I'm not the only couple who have met through gorilla gardening, I know. Um, and this is Sunny. And what they're doing there are harvesting the lavender. Because although it wasn't our intention, we realized that actually lavender has value. Lavender is a cash crop. And it's good to harvest for the plants as well. So in the summer, I would gather together a gorilla gardening harvest team, and we would then make the lavender, dry it out into fragrant pillows. And this is one of our very splendid pillows that we could then sell online. We even actually got Liberties and Selfridges, two very prestigious department stores. They, they stocked it for a while as well. Um, and all this success led in 2011 to Camilla, who is now our queen consort, who will be crowned uh, later this week. Um, she came to visit. Now, this was a remarkable invitation um, because this garden still has no permission, no contract, no formal agreement. I just took it over and started gardening and hoped that people would like what I did. Um, and the fact that there's a little bit of a royal endorsement was a good sign. Um, I wondered whether they would give us their stamp of approval for when selling the lavender pillows, pillows what we call the royal warrant, but um, that was sadly not granted. That would be a step too far. But uh, this was a good endorsement. And as you'll hear and hopefully appreciate, my mission is to try and encourage more people to do this and to help protect the gardens that exist by making it more socially acceptable. There are many other locations in my area. This is, this is where I lived. So it was about adopting patches around my neighborhood. So that's end of chapter one. I'm now going to tell you a bit about how it's become what it is today. So when I started in 2004, that little patch outside my front door, I decided to blog about it. And I registered guerrillagardening.org. And at the beginning, it was simply my blog. This is an era when, if you went online, you were a blogger, um, not an influencer or a social media content creator. You were just a blogger. And my blog listed what I was doing, the before and the after, and sometimes how much it cost. And it was my insurance policy for those who might wonder what's going on, what was there before, perhaps they hadn't noticed something. And it was a way of saying, I am proud and public about this, even though I'm being undercover when I do the gardening, by doing it in the evening and at night. 
because I wanted to avoid the confrontation with anyone in the moment, but be able to share what I was doing after the moment. Later that year, when going online to see whether my website was visible, I had the incredible moment of discovering the Green Gorillas in New York and realizing that, of course, there were other people around the world who were probably doing this. And some of them were using the term guerrilla gardening as well. But there wasn't a lot. And most importantly, they were disconnected. The Green Gorillas focus, and still today, is New York. And that is tremendous. And the work that they do is remarkable. But what I saw the opportunity was to create connections. So like any like-minded passion or hobby or strange activity or campaign, the internet has that power to join us together wherever we are. So while you might feel alone and unusual and odd in your community or in your street, you can find like-minded people online who inspire you and guide you and make you realize actually this is this is worth getting on with. So that's what guerrillagardening.org slowly evolved into becoming. Um, and I was invited to write a book. I never sought to look for an opportunity, but was really honored to be told, no, you've got to, you've got to turn this into something that can reach more people. Um, and my book was published in Korean in 2012. As technology has evolved and social media has risen up, it has enabled that source of inspiration to be much more decentralized. So I haven't spent so much time on my website in recent years because there just isn't the need. Facebook groups have been emerging, Twitter profiles, Instagram profiles. So the inspiration now happens in many different ways. Um, and it's wonderful to see different motivations, different aesthetics, different groups, solo people, groups. It happens in many, many different ways. And I'll give you a few little examples of some of the people I've met. Um, this is uh, Nagasang on the right-hand side. She lives uh, in Gaborone in Botswana. And I had the good fortune to be invited to Botswana by the British Council to talk to schools and um, NGOs there about the techniques I was using to encourage guerrilla gardening. Um, and I met Nagasang, who is a guerrilla gardener. And her motivation is growing food that she can hand out to her community uh, and raising money. And she spotted the opportunity in the wasteland beyond her garden. Um, there's a video on my guerrilla gardening channel on youtube.com, the guerrilla gardener, where you can see her story. Um, the landowner eventually found out, it was private land, uh, but he liked what she was doing and said, you can continue, but if I want that land back, you've got to give it back without any trouble. Um, this is Luke, who I met in Montreal. I was in Montreal for my brother's wedding and did some detective work, and Luke had been in touch. He is a gardener by trade, but he loves it so much, he's adopted huge areas at the back of the sidewalk and he's had to bring in soil to be able to do this. My starting point is normally you know natural soil, soil that's been left there by the infrastructure but he created a garden from absolutely nothing and it's beautiful. So although guerrilla gardening has become much more decentralized now, um, there's an event coming up for Oh, uh, I think the 16th or seven, no, 16th time, which is International Sunflower Guerrilla Gardening Day. This was um, invented by the Brussels Guerrilla Gardeners, and uh, they encourage people to sow sunflowers every year on the 1st of May. And here we go outside uh, Peronet House. Here's some guerrilla gardeners in Poland, in Gdansk, in uh, Mumbai, in, in Germany. Uh, in Utah, all over the world, taking part and sharing their photos on social media. And here are some of the guerrilla gardening sunflower successes from London. And it's happening today, promoted here by those original guerrillas, the green guerrillas in New York. So 
First of all, it's the inclusiveness and the global connections that has made guerrilla gardening something that I think has caught the popular imagination. There's a strong sense that it is connecting people around the world. The second reason is the subterfuge. The fact that a lot of what has been done, particularly in the early days when we were more cautious, was at night. It's not just to avoid confrontation with city people, it's also because it's a convenient time of day. If we've been at work, meeting up at seven o'clock in the evening, eight o'clock after work is a social time to do it and a good chance to meet people who are also coming home and, and not at work. Here are some of the gatherings that I've organized in London. Likewise in Miami, Guerrilla Gardeners. The other reason is the deliberate and mischievous appropriation of that militaristic language. Now, although it isn't to everyone's taste, it is increasingly mainstream. Of course, Che Guevara had very serious objectives. Um, we don't necessarily agree with them, but the legacy is that that word guerrilla is often used to describe something simply mischievous, unconventional. And hence, those green guerrillas in New York and myself borrowed the term. Um, Vanessa Harden, who is a very inventive gardening artist, um, she calls herself the subversive gardener. And here, she's adopting the James Bond gadget style methods. This is a briefcase that has a special um, uh, drilling device in to be able to plant seeds and the handbag as well can surreptitiously drop seeds into the ground. Um, um, Mansanobu Fuku, sorry, Mansanobu, Man, I'll say it again, Mansanobu Fukuoka, in 1938, a Japanese man invented seed bombs. This enables one to garden spaces that you otherwise perhaps couldn't reach. Um, it's a more hit and miss approach. You're letting nature do a lot of the uh, decision making in effect um, by mixing seeds with soil and throwing them in. So there's the militaristic side, but there are many other gardeners as well. Here we've got gardeners who bring fun to it, dressing as bumblebees. Um, this is the uh, um, green earth gardeners. Um, we've got pixie gardeners. We've got pirate gardeners in Germany. It's playing with language. The other underlying reason why I think this connected with people are two deep threats and anxieties. And artists sometimes inadvertently, sometimes consciously pick up on those underlying cultural um, zeitgeists and pressures to um, reflect in their art. And one of them is the significant anxiety that, that we all have about the state of our climate and that we should be doing more about it to be improving our landscape. And the other one is the horrible and unnerving threat of terrorism and war. It, but it, guerrilla gardening, strangely adopts both of those. And I think it's the positive action of doing something about the environment, but doing it in a way that actually guerrilla gardeners in Germany have said is the behavior of terrorists. I have been stopped by the police as a suspected terrorist, which was shocking, but in some ways reassuring because they were concerned when they saw my car was laden with wood chip that it might be something more serious. So guerrilla gardening taps into that latent fear that we have both about the environment and about war and, and atrocities, but makes it a positive. It doesn't resolve those problems, of course, um, although it's making small steps to improve the environment, but it reassures us that there is good out there, I hope. Um, this group pictured, I should just explain, our Extinction Rebellion. So their motivation was to bring food uh, to an area in, in Washington that was a food desert. Um, Extinction Rebellion, like many protest groups, using guerrilla gardening to say something, to make a statement, even if in their case the gardens aren't likely to last for long. Having said all of that, I would like to emphasize that there are plenty of guerrilla gardeners who are not young, they're not doing it at night, they're not doing it 
in big groups. They are people like June in Urchfont, a little village in England, who adopted a traffic island on her own and became loved in her community for it. So that when she celebrated her 80th birthday, it was her gorilla garden that was celebrated in her birthday cake. Such was it as a big part of her identity. Um, it's caught the popular imagination. Um, the media has played a really important part in popularizing it and normalizing it, uh, inspiring people to share what they've already been doing or to get doing it for the first time. Um, I'm running out of time a bit, according to the clock, but I'd like to show you some of a video that KBS in Korea recorded of our guerrilla gardening in London a few years ago. Chungeshin 영국 런던의 번화가 밤이 되자 한 무리의 사람들이 나타났습니다. 저마다 손에 농기구를 들고 도심을 걷는 사람들. 잠시 후 이들은 차가 다니는 길 한가운데 있는 봉터를 발견하자 서둘러 땅을 팝니다. 누구에게도 허락을 받지 않고 남물레 꽃을 심고 사라지는 사람들 게릴라 정원사들입니다. 최근 영국이 수도 런던에서는 도시 곳곳에 방치돼 있는 빈 공터를 새로운 환경으로 바꾸자는 자발적 시민운동이 일어나고 있습니다. 그 환경운동이 중심에 서 있는 사람이 있습니다. 런던이 아파트에 살고 있는 리처드 레이놀즈. 그는 게릴라 정원사들의 총사령관입니다. 리처드는 밤이 되면 차를 타고 도심으로 나갈 준비를 합니다. 오늘 밤 그는 예전부터 받은 공터에 기습적으로 꽃을 심을 계획입니다. 리처드의 차고는 나무 심기에 필요한 도구를 보관하는 창고로 바뀌었습니다. 그런데 오늘은 다른 때보다 챙기는 물건들이 많습니다. Only a little bit of work is required. Um, but this will be a big one. Unjo song man namgigo, shall go up chego na zaya, modun jumbiga kuna smida. So dulo chagap chang soro yang anen Richard. 리처드는 오늘 어떤 일들을 하게 될까? 도착한 곳은 주차로 사이에 위치한 공원. 리처드는 2004년부터 8년째 게릴라 정원사 활동을 하고 있습니다. 게릴라 정원사란 버려진 땅을 남몰래 꽃밭으로 만드는 사람을 뜻합니다. Is very complicated and by no means guaranteed to succeed. Okay, I think we'll end that 있습니다. film there. There's loads more. You can watch the rest of that report on on my YouTube channel. Um, I haven't got much time left, but I just want to show you some of the impacts now um, 
beyond simply encouraging people to become a guerrilla gardener. This is impact that uh, was quite surprising to start with um, and it's sometimes a bit, a bit uh, discomforting but I think is relevant for anyone in the audience who is in the industry. Um, so this is, uh, this is a film made by uh, Strongbow Cider. So this is an example of how a lot of brands have heard of guerrilla gardening now and have realized that this is something that they think is relevant for their buyers as a way of making their brand popular and interesting. So this is a TV commercial for cider from South Africa. Um, this is uh, Adidas. They did a guerrilla gardening film. I'm afraid it was fake. Uh, there were plastic plants, there were actors. Um, this is a poster with plastic plants. This is absolutely uh, not to my taste. Um, however, it did raise awareness of guerrilla gardening, even if it perhaps confused a few people. Um, this one is bizarre. It's for a brand of tights, Calzedonia. They are guerrilla gardening. Calcedonia svela il meglio di te. Um, I, of course, got asked to do a lot of this sort of stuff as well. And in most cases, when an idea would be shared or the brand would be described, um, I quite simply said no. But occasionally, the proposal made sense to me because it was genuine gardening or it was genuine playfulness. It was floristry in some ways, I suppose you could say. So I was invited by Havana Club to promote the fun that can be had growing your own mint. Mint is one of the easiest plants to grow. Um, it's terribly invasive. So actually in a gorilla garden, if it's a confined concrete space, it's actually quite good. Um, this was a mint tornado I created for them. Um, and uh, a fairly ethical bank called the Cooperative Bank in the UK also helped me create a new gorilla garden and documented the creation of that for use in one of their TV commercials, which for me was a way of reaching loads more people and another stamp of endorsement from a respected institution. The horticultural industry has got into it too. Um, you can make your own seed bombs from basic materials, but it's messy uh, and it's not necessarily that reliable, although the, the chance of it is part of the fun, I think. Um, Darren is a guerrilla gardener I met in Glasgow and a brilliant entrepreneur and designer and he created this brand of Seed Bomb uh, which is hugely popular um, and available all over the UK. Um, other people have had a go too. Um, this is uh, bee flower bombs, more bee bombs. So again, that militaristic language has been appropriated by these manufacturers. Other people call them seed balls. Um, in Germany here, that garden pirate, the Garten Piraten label has been used by a manufacturer. Um, as it says, guerrilla gardening on the packet. Um, I teamed up with someone I met at a festival to uh, create some accessories. These are made from abandoned tents. So people go to a festival in a tent and some of them just leave the tent there, all this wasted plastic. Um, and this artist realized she could make things from that. So I teamed up with her and we got our product into Selfridges. Bags for carrying tools and coats to wear um, anytime or when you're gardening, made from old tents. Um, there's also, of course, the classic gorilla tub. Now, there's a bit of wordplay here that might be lost in translation, but gorilla, the small fighter, uh, sounds very like gorilla, the big animal. Um, so you get the gorilla tubs. 
The Green Gorilla's original logo, those New York Gorilla Gardeners, was actually a gorilla, uh, which I think adds to the confusion, but it's quite fun. And here's a, another bit of fun branding, the Kong F1 hybrid of the sunflower seeds here, uh, inspired by, of course, the biggest gorilla, King Kong. Um, Vanessa, the subversive gardener who you saw earlier, she's also created a line of jewellery inspired by her guerrilla gardening, um, which also brings and shows how gardening can be in categories that you wouldn't traditionally think it has any relevance to do with at all. So guerrilla gardening has played a big part in making gardening feel more exciting, feeling more accessible for those who don't even have a garden um, and not just for older people with a space of their own. I finally, I'm out of time I know, but I finally just want to explain what's happened more recently. This is another of my gardens in London many years ago. There it is thriving with verbena and hollyhocks, but sadly, as I said earlier, I lost a lot of them to redesign of the roads. And the mayor of London, who was Boris Johnson at the time, he declared, his designer declared, he wanted vistas of stone, which was very sad and it made me feel very unwelcome. So after a few battles, which I lost, um, we left London and I left all my gardens and my three best ones are now thriving under new care from people that I met when I was there. So for the last five years, I've been in Totnes in Devon, and this was my starting point. The little park over the road, a pocket park that had seen better days and the local authority had not been looking after. We lived next to it, and I still have no garden. So over the years, we've been sorting it out, painting the bench, getting my kids involved, Neighbours have donated plants and the media have even taken interest too in a prestigious um, gardening magazine which was a lovely stamp of endorsement because they only show the most beautiful gardens in that magazine. Um, that was in 2013. And these are photos from last week. The tulips and the gorilla tulips, the fluffy dark ones, they're called gorillas, um, growing in, in the garden there. So, this garden's five years old. I never asked permission. I have no formal agreement, but it's enjoyed by lots of people and the guerrilla gardening continues. Please remember, sow your sunflowers on May the 1st. Um, follow me on Twitter. I've been tweeting now for years as Richard underscore 001. Um, I finally got round in the last couple of weeks to doing a bit more on Instagram as Richard.Reynolds. So please uh, follow me there and share what you're doing. Um, if you become or already are a guerrilla gardener. Thank you very much. Thank you, all our speakers. Oh, yes. We have a QA session. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm not much. running away. No, yes, <laughs> questions, of course. 네, 좋습니다. 저희가 멋진 또 발표 수고해 주셨는데요. 시간이 넉넉하진 않지만 한 가지 정도 질문을 받으면서 마무리를 해 보면 좋을 것 같습니다. 혹시 발표 내용 중에서 궁금했던 부분이 있으시다면 손을 들어 주시고요. 네, 마이크 전달을 좀 부탁을 드리겠습니다. 손 다시 한번 들어 주시겠습니까? 네. Very good, yes. I used to work at night more to avoid confrontation. However, that can also raise suspicion. So actually my recommendation now is to go out sort of daylight hours, early evening, weekend, um, and if anyone is anxious about what you're doing, you just reiterate that you're a volunteer. So that's my first point. My second point is as local to where you live as possible so that you do understand the landscape. You have a sense of who might be doing something with it, who might not be. Is it at risk of occasionally being cut down? You know, dog owners can be a big problem. 
So if you're a bit familiar with it, that, that helps and you can see that it is neglected. Um, it also, if it's local, enables you to enjoy it and keep an eye on it because these public places, if they begin to look bad again, can quickly deteriorate. I've had plants taken out by people who I think think they're rescuing them because in the early days I tried to look after locations that were too far from home and too difficult to look after. Um, if you don't think you can look after it, then you know, bulbs, sunflower seeds, they don't need, you know, the Californian poppies, they don't need much, much looking after. Um, and then also, if you want support, if you want people to help out, a little sign, a handwritten sign, a notice, maybe something on social media um, can attract like-minded people. But generally, the people I see actually who are most successful over the long term just are obsessive and passionate and just get on and do it and people help them from time to time but it, it, it can be quite hard to sustain a long-running group unless your space is a community garden like the green gorillas where you've got a really clearly defined space that you have some sense of ownership over in the end when there are these marginal bits of land kind of personal commitments really what keeps them going um, and friendly chit chat with with the community as they get to know you as they can see the results they realize okay this person really is you know they know what they're doing um and and you're appreciated i hope that helps thank you very much for your answer and it's a real time to wrap up the presentation so thank you very much for your insightful presentation 여러분 다시 한번 큰 박수로 감사 인사 부탁드리겠습니다 고맙습니다